Welcome to the Long Range Pursuit Podcast, presented by Gunworks, where we learn about and share long-range shooting techniques, science, and gear. All right, welcome to Long Range Pursuit Podcast. I'm Garrett Wall, and I'm joined today by Zach McDermott, a 307 native here, Wyoming Ike, with the Wyoming Wild Sheep Foundation. Hey, good morning. Zach's driven over the mountain to spend some time with us this morning. And we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about some wild sheep. We're going to talk about conservation, a couple, couple very neat topics, a lot going on in the state of Wyoming. Uh, Zach, take a minute and introduce yourself if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, Zach McDermott. I'm uh, originally from Omaha, Nebraska, grew up uh, in the hunting and fishing world with my dad and my grandfather taking us as little kids. And so it's always been a huge passion of mine. And uh, 2005, I was transferred up to Wyoming from Colorado and really got into elk hunting extensively. And then, uh, yeah, in 2016, a gentleman that I had done a lot of elk foundation work with, uh, committee work there and, uh, recruited me to come over to Wyoming Wild Sheep and be on the board. And, uh, I always laugh. He looked at me and said, you're going to be on the board, whether you like it or not. (laughs) And so, yeah, 2016, I got on the board and then, uh, in 2020, I became president and I've been the president ever since. So, now I reside, reside in Sheridan, and and uh, yeah, bighorn sheep is absolutely my passion. So awesome! This is this is a bit of a labor of love, as I I've got to know you over the years. It is uh, there's a lot of work. The financial rewards personally aren't aren't commensurate with the effort that gets put in, but that's okay. It, it's it's for a cause and it's for a purpose. Not everybody gets conservation. Uh, I've noticed. Yeah. In, and that's and that's fine. You know, we we do we do events like this to try and help shine a light and, and promote and and help bring awareness to to the opportunities, the need that are there. But I've noticed there's this thread with we work with a, a lot of different organizations, a lot of different groups, and there's this common thread. But behind those folks that are at the presidents or the board level, there's just this passion that mm. they're doing. It's a labor of love, and they're doing it for um, you know kind of a higher cause. Yeah, it sounds like that's the case for you as well. Yeah, and it really does come down to the passion about it, and it takes an extensive amount of time, which in today's world we don't have a lot of. But it's there's commitment and sacrifice, and uh, I'm lucky enough that my family is on board with the time that I spend doing it. Um, they know that this is what I do, what I love, and uh, you know when I see those whether it's a lamb, the ewes, the rams, anything. I just, I get giddy like a little kid and it just, it really is a driver. And I learned early on in the conservation world that the wildlife doesn't have a voice. They can't speak up. Sure. And so somebody has to do it for them. Sure. And uh, a great comment to me was said to me the other day of, you know, bighorn sheep can't pay their own way. And so we got to do it for them. Yeah. And so with that, just knowing what Wyoming Wild Sheep has done, uh, you know, over the last, this is our 40th year, uh, we'll be having our banquet and man, what a ride. And the amount of money and time and effort and boots on the ground has been tremendous. And uh, and we need to continue it on because it's this is a generational thing yeah. that if we don't do it, you know, it's our kids, our grandkids, and we want to have them have the same opportunity that we did. And so it's, uh, it can also be an expensive passion to have as we, you know, as, you know, some of us try to try to go get a grand slam or whatever. And, but, uh, sure is fun. Let's ask, let me ask you this question for our audience or viewers that, so this is Wyoming wild sheep. This is a, it's an organization here in the, in the state of Wyoming. You have Wild Sheep Foundation. There's a number of these different. You see some at the state level and some bigger. I gather we're all in this for a common goal, you know, together, and that is, you know, wild sheep. Um, why, I was reading your note, looks like 1983 this chapter was started. Why start a, a Wyoming chapter of wild sheep? Why not have one of the the bigger chapters? Why Why do some of these state-level chapters pop up? You know, it becomes, uh, like with Wyoming, obviously way before my time, but it was, you know, 
the interaction with domestic animals. It's mm -hmm. uh, seen decline in numbers, you know, and really comes down to the sportsmen and their passion for the animal. At the state level. It, yeah, and it's uh, coming back to saying we got to support these animals sure. any which way we can. Sure. And uh, uh, you talk about how an organization grows over 40 years yeah. is in talking to some of the people that were involved e even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was, we're having a bake sale to try to raise money. Sure. You know, now we're at the convention level of well over 400 people mm -hmm. and the amount of money we can raise. And, and so the, the transformation over time, but it really came down to, it was a group of gentlemen that they were very passionate about sheep and, uh, you know, and a couple of them are still involved today. And it's great because it's, you can't replicate that knowledge. And I talked to one the other day, Jim Collins, and just picking his brain and you just sit there and wow. Sure. Yeah, I'm a legend. Yeah, and so that's on. Um, that's very cool. You know, I agree. The the at the state level, I just think about the winter we had two years ago, and the and antelope and deer herds that got decimated, and some of the work that's going on there. Like if if we don't take care of them at this level, I don't think we can expect anybody else to come in and and understand that the you know the red desert herds and mm -hmm. or the you know the mule deer herd out of Jackson is is struggling right i i think taking those matters into our own hands as you said is a very responsible thing to do mm -hmm. very cool mm -hmm. help me let's talk just a little bit about the organization you know january 1st you guys are planning for a, a calendar year fiscal year what are your how are funds raised what does fundraising look like what are you guys trying to accomplish mm -hmm. during that year for this organization yeah, so our calendar year is Jan 1. Uh, you know, our first big event that we go to is Sheep Show okay. uh, for Wild Sheep Foundation, and that's where our first governor tag is. So Wyoming's, uh, we have five governor tags okay. for bighorn sheep. So that's where the first event starts. And with that, we're going to, the, to try to find hunts and really start planning for our event, so our banquet, our live auction. And so, and then in those next couple months, the other three uh, governor tags get sold. And so gives us a pretty good idea on what kind of money is coming into the state for bighorn sheep. But then with that is, with our event is always in the beginning of June, we get to see what else do we need to do better? What else do we need to get for our banquet to really dial in to raise money? And then we have a grant and aid application period. So that's, we get projects from whether it's Game and Fish, the Forest Service, um, you know, University of Wyoming, uh, they they put in their grant and aid. We go through uh, a review process of funds asked, the timeline, and, and really, a number one is how is it benefiting sheep? Uh, because these uh, a lot of this can be sheep specific funding, but uh, and then also we also have an idea where we sit money's wise of what we have the ability to spend. And so uh, we go through pretty extensive uh, calling of these projects to make sure it's the right fit. And um, luckily enough, we have a tremendous relationship with Game and Fish and their bighorn sheep people that we're communicating all the time. So we know what's coming in, sure. uh, where they need help. And so with that, um, that really leads us up to our when we have our membership meeting in June and get all the approvals for grant and aid of here's what's been applied for, here's what we think is applicable, and here's the amount of money we have to spend. So this grant aid, that's money going back out. Yeah, People that'll be for projects, okay. research. Okay. Uh, you know, we've spent several hundred thousand dollars or allocated several hundred thousand dollars over the last couple of years for cheat grass and noxious weeds okay. and because of some of the fires that have happened throughout the state. And so you take a look at that is that's not only benefiting bighorn sheep, you know, because we look at is it summer habitat, winter ranger, sure. but it's also all wildlife, especially yeah. the mule deer and the elk and, yeah. you know, their migratory patterns. And so, um, yeah, so we have a we go into June and we get membership approval and then, okay. you know, we let the 
So the members vote on this then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We just don't have free range of spending the money as we, but that's part of our, you know, as a board doing our job of spending the money the right way. Sure. And, um, you know, we've been fortunate enough to really have some great years of fundraising and have a lot of money to spend. And uh, we often joke with Game and Fish is bring us projects. We need to spend money. We don't, we're not here to sit on it. Sure. We want to spend Absolutely. it. And, uh, Absolutely. and so, yeah. And then we get to see it transformation. And, and then what we do is we also have a winter meeting. And when we put the location for a winter meeting, it's usually where we've done sheep projects. Okay. And so, you know, last year was uh, in Dubois. And so some of the habitat enhancement we've been doing for the whiskey herd, because that's been struggling. Or uh, a couple years ago, we did Sabio Canyon in the research center, Game and Fish Research Center. Well, we've been doing, spent a tremendous amount of money on cheatgrass over there. And you could really see on the hillsides where it's been treated, where it hasn't. Okay. And then Game and Fish explains, hey, here's the next treatment area and how that progression happens. And so it's pretty neat in the winter seeing the money is working mm-hmm. and it's been, you know, the boots are on the ground and, you know, reaping the benefits of what it looks like. So. And thinking back to your agenda, a little bit of this annual meeting, if I'm not mistaken at times, I know when you came to did that Cody one a couple of years ago, you're, you're doing some meetings and then you're actually going out and seeing some of the, like we've got that herd that kind of winters down yeah. here. Right, outside the park. Yeah, so when we did the one here in Cody, we teamed up with the Monteith shop out of the University of Wyoming, sure. and they did a capture and collar. Awesome. And so we actually had a chance uh, to go out there, right there with the biologist, Amazing. and touch the animals Amazing. and, you know, be pretty careful with them. I mean, they, they do a good job of, sure. you know, uh, handling and sure. making sure that they're not getting stressed too much. And so- but it was fascinating. And I think one of the neatest things about that one in particular was all of the youth that was there. Oh, sure. And the kids' eyes when they got it right next to a sheep. Yeah. And then, you know, wow. And so they're again creating that passion early on mm-hmm. for wildlife and bighorn sheep. And yeah. really neat to see. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought up the, the kind of the spending side of it. I've got a graph pulled up here. It's on your website and it's of the last 20 years and it's not dollars, but it's percentages of where some of these funds go. And maybe we can dive into a little bit. It looks like of the, of the pie, um, this bar, this pie graph, 37% goes to population management and monitoring. So the lion's share of funds looks like it's going to population management and monitoring. I'm guessing monitoring is dealing with collaring. Yep. Uh, why don't you t- talk a little bit more about what entails so those dollars that are going out what is population man it, so it's a capture and uh like you did just like yeah just like we just did and so it's the collaring but then it's also uh the disease monitoring mm-hmm. you know always checking for disease but then the the big key with the collaring is checking migration patterns you know where they're wintering you know where how far are they moving mm-hmm. um for example we saw some collar data of some of the sheep out of Unit 1 okay. and actually how far into Montana they go as just part of their range, coming back and forth, you know, between spring, summer, and winter and their lambing areas. And so, um, but then the other part of it too is, and this has been very successful in Whiskey Basin, is they do the implants into the ewes. And so when the lamb drops... The signal comes on, and the biologists immediately run up there. Okay. Rain, snow, or shine. Okay. And they are troopers. I mean, they really battle the elements, and they'll be there within possibly hours of that lamb hitting the ground and take blood samples, collar it, and then let it let it go. And um, that has been extremely beneficial in understanding lamb survival. Okay. And so- there's just a tremendous amount of effort, hence why there's so many dollars put towards that is, you know, especially with uh, the way disease has been through bighorn sheep throughout the West, it's catching it from right when they hit the ground. Mm-hmm. How are they, you know, what was the condition of the ewe, uh, you know, when they were lambing and, you know, what is the condition of the lamb as it drops and, you know, start using, building that database to really help 
move forward. Hey, where can we get better? You know, is it a forage issue? Is it a um, predator issue? You know, identifying what some of the problems are that we're facing with big horn sheep. Mm, absolutely. Does on that data, you're talking about the database, where does that data live? Is that, is our game and fish department that, that goes back to them? So they have access to it and, uh, but primarily, uh, that goes through the Montese shop. Okay. Yeah. And that's Dr. Kevin Montese. Okay. Um, and he is a phenomenal biologist. His okay. team is phenomenal. Okay. And so, you know, he is really renowned for bighorn sheep and mule deer. Okay. And so, uh, you know, he always comes to our banquets and gives us the download of how things are progressing. And, um, so yeah, he, they do all that, uh, data processing and, you know, give us all the reports and pretty, pretty phenomenal what they produce. Yeah. Um, that's neat. That's very neat. Your top three, you get to 75% of the funds spent between population management and monitoring, habitat and education and outreach. Uh, you talked a little bit about the cheat grass. I'm guessing that's kind of the habitat. Well, sure. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, uh, whether it's water development, okay. uh, conifer removal, okay. uh, fencing, you know, uh, burns, prescribed burns. And then, then, you know, after the burns are done, whether it's natural or prescribed coming in and doing the, the cheat grass treatment. And, and that really then, and where those come from is the studies from the forage assessments from the Monte shop of what is their forage? You know, it's, if the sheep have good groceries, Sure. No different than a human. Sure. If they have good groceries, they're going to build their fat. They're going to be a lot more resistant to disease mm -hmm. and and predators, you know, getting being able to escape. Mm -hmm. And so um, the habitat is just another, it's just one piece of it that's so critical. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the other piece, you know, when you and I were talking earlier is people understanding that it's just not the individual segments of conservation of how to make these, what's best for the animal sure. is this all works together, you know, and, um, it, it truly is a, a pie of, you got to have this, to have this, to have this in order to have an overall success of bighorn sheep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm thinking back to some emails that I get from Katie. I think she's your, um, your director. Is that her title? Yep. At the Executive point? director. Um, there's a few projects that it looks like the Wyoming, Wild Sheep Foundation does as a as a group. Mm -hmm. I, I can remember a water, um, something to do with some with some water in one area. But you are assembling some of the members, some of the board, I'm guessing, and mm -hmm. going out and putting boots on the ground. Yeah, sometimes we, you're writing a check. Sometimes you're doing it yourself. Yeah. So uh, one of the things, and this is the great thing about Wyoming, is we all uh, you know band together. And so when we have a habitat project, so the big thing is guzzlers. Okay. And there's a lot of effort that goes into a guzzler, and yeah, we'll recruit. You know, we send an email out to the board, to our membership, uh, or even outreach to others. And, uh, hey, we have a guzzler and here's how many people we need. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we did a uh, guzzler project a couple of years in the Ferris Seminole. And it was all by hand. I mean, removing of the rocks. I mean, it was picks, shovels, axes. And, Some you know, there, you know, the the guzzler itself was able to be moved up to a point with machine. And then after that, you know, laying out the fabric for the water catch. I mean, all of that is done by hand. Yeah. And so it takes a few people to do that and pull it off. But the big thing is people really enjoy it. Sure. And they come out in droves of how can I help? Where do I go? You know, last year we had a big fence project and a lot of people showed up. And so that's for us, that's, kind of our big summer event, you know, after our banquet and everybody calms down a little bit and takes a, takes a breath. It's, uh, Hey, we got a project in August. Let's do it. So, and we coordinate that a lot with whether it's game and fish, the BLM, uh, the forest service, it's kind of who's, where's it at, who's managing it and, uh, what help do you need? So, yeah. Very cool. And, and, and the other part of it too, is cause we're doing one, uh, early summer is uh, a big fence project and really doesn't entail big one cheap. It's just, they needed help and it's a, sure. you know, a premier deer and elk area and yeah. we're out there. Where will that be? What area? Uh, it's somewhere in the big horns. I can't, okay. I, I haven't, uh, 
read the official invite in depth, but, um, you know, so that, that's pretty neat that the other organizations or the other uh, departments of game and fish will reach out and say, we need volunteer help. And our, our membership, uh, jumps at the yeah. opportunity. Good. Very good. Education and outreach. Um, where are those dollars going? You know, whether it's youth, adults, it's really educating people on what conservation is yeah. and how, there again, it's generational. You know, we got to start teaching our kids young yeah. if they want to have that opportunity. And so whether, you know, we do a big youth event at our banquet yeah. um, and just seeing the kids get excited and we give them prizes and... Uh, you know, we do a lot of uh, co collaboration with the National Bighorn Sheep Center. And so we provide some of that, like that funding is sponsorships over there for a lot of the programs they do for, and it's not just youth. Everybody thinks education and outreach. Everybody thinks kids. Sure. And um, it's more than that. I mean, it's uh, pretty amazing the the people we've seen come. Yeah. We, have, we have a family now that comes every year to both of our events from Minnesota. Very and cool. they just they heard about it and they showed up and on board. Their 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 kids are involved, the parents are involved, and they have a blast. And they are huge supporters of Wyoming Wild Sheep and yeah. Wyoming and you know, and that was purely with just that outreach and educating the kids and yeah. the family and when I came to your banquet, this was uh last year, not this last winter, but the year before when you were in Cody. You guys gave away, I think in conjunction with Game and Fish, but you gave away, I think some, if I'm not mistaken, lifetime conservation stamps mm -hmm. to some of the youth that were there. Yep. And I remember how excited they were. They all went to the front and they were super jazzed. You know, the parents were, it, I thought it was neat. I yeah. remember that since that yeah. banquet, that what a way to kind of create a little spark for those kids to, to, you know, hopefully carry on, you know, much farther into the future. Yeah. And what was really neat about that too is, the sponsorship from donors that came. Yeah. And as soon as, you know, the idea came out and we reached out to a few people, they, absolutely. How, how much money do you need? Yeah. Because they knew that essentially that legacy that it can help create. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very cool. Well, cool. Well, uh, yeah, that's, so that's, those are, those are areas where no shortage of need then for some of these funds that, mm -hmm. that, you know, that you guys are out, you know, raising. You know, I, I have a question about wild sheep over the last four years, since about COVID. I don't know if it was COVID or just coincidentally around then. You know, tags in general have, mm -hmm. we've seen a surge in tag prices, but but sheep have been scary. Uh, I mean, I can remember when the governor's tag here in Wyoming didn't, wasn't six figures. It's now well into that number. You know, to uh, th I think you guys are raising at some auctions. You know, the doll sheep used to be, you know, ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars in some areas. In the Yukon, it's it's got a four in it now. It's forty something thousand dollars. It's just incredible what what the value of, of of wild sheep has done over the last couple of years. And so I, I've thought to myself, how you can get excited about chipping in with with elk because we all can hunt elk. If you live in Wyoming, you hunt elk every year over the counter. An awesome opportunity. You know, if I was Doing my math right, there's only, there's 200, and you you jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I saw 200 sheep tags in, in Wyoming. About 40 of those were ewe tags. Am I, does that sound, does that sound? Sounds about right. Kind yeah. Of. So very few people, and, and oddly enough, you got to meet one this morning. I won't share his name. I think he's trying to stay incognito still a little bit, but one of our employees drew the random tag in, mm -hmm. in a unit up in, in this neck of the woods. Hasn't been a resident very long, but literally won the lottery. Uh, you know, yeah. in today's, a lot of folks were not to save the kind of money to buy that tag. We're going to have to draw that tag in a lot of cases. So how do you think you get, take someone like me, I'm I'm not writing a check tomorrow to go bighorn sheep hunting. So how do you motivate somebody like me to jump in on this conservation on bighorn sheep where I'm not going to get to hunt them each year like I will my, the pronghorn and the mm -hmm. elk and the deer? I like to say that the bighorn sheep is the canary in the mine. Okay. If you have healthy bighorn sheep and healthy bighorn sheep habitat, you're going to have good mule deer. Yeah. You're going to have good elk. And so with that, it's 
looking at it in, as a big picture um, uh, item of, you know, this, yeah, this, this focus may be big on cheap, but it's really going to benefit down the line. Well, wow. and, uh, and to me, a lot of that just comes from your passion for hunting outdoors. Yeah. I mean, and getting out there. And so, um, you know, and then the other part of it too, with, and I think, which is really neat about Oregon organization is the relationships that are built and the camaraderie. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll only be able to draw a tag once. Sure. You know, and, but it's, it, that's why I go back to somebody has to be the voice of the animal. Sure. And, um, and so it's, you know, and then it takes a special person, to be honest, to dedicate yeah. that time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and we've seen people come and go, um, cause some of it were, you've seen where people just think it's about putting on a banquet yeah. and, you know, or others just couldn't dedicate the time. And so it also comes down to the individual and who you are and really, if, if you want to spend your time doing that, yeah. but, um, you know. I was fortunate enough to draw a Colorado tag in 21, a bighorn tag. Wow. And what really sparked me even more was when we were up there scouting and lamb and ewes are literally almost coming up to your tent. Sure. And they're checking you out. And, you know, the one day my dad and I got up sitting out having a coffee and here comes just a couple ewes. Hey, what are you guys doing over there? And then when I was doing my hunt, uh, how many times I ran into lambs and ewes and just, you're seeing them on the landscape. I mean, the one was 25 yards away and she was just staring at me and you're going, this is what it's all about. It, it's not just, it can't be just about the harvest and what did I score? And, sure. and, uh, you know, I've, people have given me grief because, Hey, what did it score? It's, I don't know. Yeah. But I got, I got the ram I wanted or the elk I wanted. And so, but I would say on my end, being out there with the animals like that and having that experience, to me, that's priceless. Yeah. And that, that's uh, um, an actual mutual friend of ours. We've had that discussion a lot of times is it's not about the animal hanging on the wall. It's, it's about the experience, sure. you know, and uh, whether it's sheep hunting in the U.S. or you know, he's been to Asia a lot of, a lot of times and you're just sitting there going, I want to do that because it's about the culture and the animal and not just, Hey, what did I harvest? Yeah. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. I, if you get to spend any time around bighorn sheep, which a lot of people don't, I mean, if you think about it, they don't, the access to them, they're, they're in such remote areas in a lot of cases. We're lucky enough in Cody, if you get here in the winter months at all and halfway between Cody and the, the East gate, the park there. There's always that herd that literally mm. you're just right off the road. I mean, 50 yards off the road. And it always garners a big, you know, there's always people pulled over and taking photos. And so the second you get to interact with one, all of a sudden you realize, you know, how neat they are, what, mm. what a special animal it is. And when you just start to look at the numbers and how few the numbers are, um, it's it's pretty special. I love the the purpose on your website of, of putting and keeping kids and wild sheep you know, on the mountain. Yeah. I thought that was a nice, Yeah, I thought that was a nice, uh, a nice plug there because you're right that the future, um, you're getting a tool to do this forever. So you're going to need a generation back. At <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I did my first cheap hunt last year. So in 20, in 23, and I booked it well before COVID. Um, it's one of those deals and be a bit of a stretch with doll sheep hunt and booked it a, a couple of years out for 2020 and then 2020 hits mm -hmm. and we lost a couple of years, you know, crossing the border. I was not able to schedule wise, was not able to make it happen in 22. So I didn't, so I've got to bike a six or seven year anticipation for this hunt. You know, you put it on your calendar and all of a sudden it's, it's just circled red and it got moved back a couple of times, but boy, what a, I'm bored everybody with the, the details, but that was one of the most challenging experience I've ever had. Just not just in hunting, but in general, you I mean, it is not for the faint of heart. It is mentally, physically, financially, it is, it'll put everything to the test. You know, I, I could be such a head case, you know, you leave in the office for two weeks and yeah. what are you leaving behind? Well, if we're trying to get guns out the door for folks. Um, and then as you're hiking around, you get into day seven, you get into day eight, the 10 day hunt and Ram's not dead yet. And how would I replace this? How could I ever do this again? And it is a, 
what an, and then it comes together. It, it came together towards the end and, and, and tagged out and what an awesome experience. But you, you, you get a glimpse by no means am I a sheep hunter. Um, I get to work with a lot of customers that are, that are, that are passionate, that are, that are very talented. They, that's what they live for. That's what they do. And I've been, I admire watching what they do because it is not, it is not for everybody, but it's pretty special um, mm-hmm. to watch it, watch it unfold. Yeah. The, de- the dedication is incredible. And, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to go on a couple different sheep hunts, you know, the Yukon, British Columbia, Colorado, and it's a lot more than physical and it's a lot more than mental. And it's all, it's about your preparation that I always say is, you know, physical is just the beginning. Yeah. And then you get into the mental yeah. and then you get into the emotional. Yeah. And with some of us, it even hits the spiritual end. Sure. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah, like you say, when you're day 10 yeah. and you haven't seen an animal, it, it will test your wit and yeah. who you are as a person. Yeah. And so that's where your preparation comes into play yeah. of, I've been here before, just another day. Yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you hear about folks breaking down and yeah. can't handle it, you know, got to come off the mountain or whatever. But, and I think that's what really makes, you know, sheep and goat hunters a special breed Yeah, because it, it it's a lot more than, uh, I hate to say it, a lot more than elk hunting or deer hunting. I mean, it, it is, it's a unique animal. It really is. And- I haven't looked at a trophy photo. I get, I get 50, 60 trophy photos a year sent to, to me from customers and, you know, folks out in the field. And I always, you know, I've always had appreciation and they're great photos and that's beautiful landscape. But after August, you know, 10th of last year, every sheep photo that I get now means something very different. You can look at the person's face that's in the photo with the sheep and you can tell, you know, how beat down and how wore down. There's usually a grin that's, that's yeah. trying to come out from the clouds, but I've never looked at a sheep photo the same after. It just means, it just means so much different yeah. now having walked, and again, by no means I'm a compass sheep hunter, but having walked down that trail once, mm-hmm. what a, what an awesome experience. Yeah. Well, Jack O'Connor, either you're a sheep hunter or you're not. Yeah. And I, I have that printed out. I look at it every day. Yes. And, I, and yeah, that's that, very true. This, Sheep honey can be, yeah, you really find out who you're made of, no, what you're made of. That's very true. That's very true. Well, let's talk, we've got, we've got a few minutes left. Let's talk nuts and bolts about some of the initiatives, some of the projects you're excited about okay. that are going on in Wyoming right now. Yeah. So, uh, three years ago, um, a private landowner in the Sweetwater Rocks area, center part of the state. Okay. So, uh, be- essentially between Casper and between Casper and Lander sure. near Jeff City. Sure. And uh, landowner approached uh, the game commission about reintroducing sheep to the Sweetwater Rocks area. And uh, it had been tried over and over. Uh, you know, they tried in 1944 and they brought in seven uh, desert bighorns from Nevada thinking that, you know, the terrain looked the same and that didn't okay. that didn't work out. And so over the years, there's been... Uh, some tries to make it happen and just for whatever reason didn't, whether it was, um, you know, uh, misconception. That's been a lot of the big issues with uh, relocations and transplants is the misconception of the information and how it's getting produced. And so, um, you know, the Sweetwater Rocks then had a, uh, uh, a another formal try in the late 90s. And um, that led to a legislation being proposed in the state of Wyoming outlawing banning all transplants and relocations for all wildlife. Okay. And uh, so that then rolled into what became the Wyoming plan, which is domestic and bighorn sheep uh plan for relocations, transplants, uh, allotments. And so then established the Interaction Working Group, which is we work with uh, the stock growers, the wool growers, game and fish, the ag of, you know, managing bighorn sheep and and along with the domestic industry through the state. And so um, with that, the, the Sweetwater Rocks has always been on everybody's radar. I remember when I first got on the board and I talked to the head 
sheep biologist for the state, and we were talking about numbers and where is the best place in the state. And uh, he goes, habitat-wise, the best place is Sweetwater Rocks, hands down. He goes, but we'll never get sheep there. We can't get people to agree. We can't get people on the same page. Mm-hmm. And there's such a dynamic to try oh, to make yeah. it happen. Yeah, ballot box biology is you know a term that gets thrown out a lot now. And so, yeah, so a uh, landowner, huge landowner in that area, went to the game commission, I said three years ago, and uh, the game commission approved moving forward with the study and uh, of what it would take to get bighorn sheep back in there, also have discussions with landowners and uh, in the area and, you know, how, how we can try to make it happen. And so first things first is uh, Dr. Montes and, you know, his crew were hired to do a habitat assessment. Mm-hmm. And that's really the first thing that happens with, with any, um, cause a number one, it's, is it even a viable area? Yeah. But then two is what is the, the interaction, the proximity with livestock yeah. and, um, what's the water, what's the forage, you know, they go through this huge study to make sure it's even possible. And so when, uh, Dr. Montes came back with his results, it was incredible yeah. of the the terrain, the amount of food there, especially up high where, you know, you're not going to have livestock up there. And quite frankly, it's about the only thing that's going to be up there is a bighorn sheep. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, and he really outlined the area and it came up with this, you know, 73,000 acres of this prime bighorn sheep area. And then um, w- the other part of what that he does is does a risk of contact. So if there is bighorn sheep, where is the nearest domestic okay. animals and how far can we, you know, is that buffer? And so with his study and it came back, his, the risk of contact was lower than anywhere else in the state. Okay. And so it, it really showed the science works. The science doesn't lie. Here's what's really going on. And so so with that, um, you know, we had our annual uh, interaction working group meeting, uh, and we've actually been meeting more and more because we've seen the need. Mm-hmm. It's and so we've been working with uh, you know the wool growers and the stock growers of how do we get there? Sure. You know, uh, what's the opportunity? And you know, and what people got to understand with policies and these plans for wildlife is the it, the landscape changes so much. And it's changed so much in 24 years, say, when the Wyoming plan was first brought into play. Mm-hmm. And so now we're revisiting of, okay, what's the dynamic now? What is, what's going on with bighorn sheep? What's going on with the domestic sheep industry? Mm-hmm. What's going on with cattle? Um, you know, what, what is the habitat now? Cause it's all changed. And so, yeah, so we, um, you know, in a lot of hard work and collaboration with the interaction working group, uh, we came up with how do we give the domestic industry assurances that, you know, if there's big horned sheep there and we do have an interaction and a risk of contact, what's the process? And so, you know, Game and Fish has their protocol that they do. And so um, in our meeting in December, uh, Senator Hicks from Bags was in there and, um, you know, and he brought up a tool that they had done in the past for successful uh, bighorn sheep uh, it is getting a some legislation passed, you know, because um, ultimately with it all, it's Wyoming, it's a Wyoming problem, mm-hmm. or it's a Wyoming issue, mm-hmm. and we're going to handle it in Wyoming. Sure. And, you know, we've been, always been a big proponent of that. We don't need, you know, it, you hear that all over in Wyoming. It's, you know, we're going to handle it internally. So, uh, yeah, we, we worked as a group to develop this language and, uh, yeah, it became Senate File 118 and uh, went through some edits and several reiterations and and uh, through this last legislative sl- session in February and March, it uh, got passed and the governor signed it. And so with that, those reassurances for the ag um, kind of leads us to, okay, what are the next steps of getting sheep back in the rocks? And so, you know, uh, Game and Fish has about the 16 to 18 month window of testing, okay. you know, if they know that a transplant or relocation is coming up. Okay. And so that they can start that process. And so, um, 
and then what that allows us to is us to do is Wyoming Wild Sheep is let's identify the project's needs in the area, mm-hmm. the habitat enhancement, the water development, conifer removal, fence. You know, there's a lot of old woven fence in there that can be removed and become wildlife friendly. And so uh, we identify that. And then, our, you know, our big key, obviously, is the fundraising piece. So sure. we'll be able to go out and talk to donors about here's where we're at, here's what's going to happen, and here's the money. And so I, I think a lot of it is is um, the other organizations that have come in and to help, okay. and they see how critical this is. And because uh, this is another project that it's with a lot of this habitat enhancement in these projects, it's mm-hmm. not just going to benefit sure. Bighorn Chief, Absolutely. especially mule deer in the area, yeah. you know, really help them out. And so- yeah, so that's kind of that's our next planning stages of getting these projects dialed in, start start the fundraising effort. So that's exciting. And Red tape has kind of been cleared, it sounds like. Yeah. And now it's uh so when I mean for fast forward for our, our audience, in a perfect world, when does the first sheep hit that? So game and fish uh like to do it in the winter. And so the proposed timeline is, you know, end of January to mid March of twenty six. Twenty six. Okay. Yeah. And that gives them the testing time mm-hmm. that they have to go through and a lot of the logistics to let us get our boots on the ground, get projects done. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, and, and, and we will continue to uh work with landowners. Sure. You know, that that the area that this is, it's just over sixty eight percent is uh BLM. Okay. There's some state and then it's right about twenty five percent private land. So, you know, we got to make sure that everybody's taken care of and uh, understands and buys in to what we're doing, um, you know, because not everybody is on board. And so it's it's just our job to make sure the, the facts are out there, but then also is, you know, some of the projects we're looking at doing really even benefit ag and the, the, um, the cattle and the domestic sheep. So- um, you know, we just got to get everybody on the same team, yeah, so to speak. But no, we feel great about it. And, uh, you know, it, it's really exciting because the good thing about this area is from some of these studies is the carrying capacity is right around 400. Okay. Which, you know, everybody knows about Ferris Seminole and the success story that that's been. You know, and that's at or near carrying capacity, which is, I believe, right around 300 animals. And, you know, that transplant had happened twice in the late 2000s, and we're already, there's already hunting tags in there. So they've really skyrocketed. And so this is the same landscape. And uh, being able to get those animals in there, and as we all see, as, as we've talked earlier, the number of limited tags. Well, how's the best way to increase tags? put more sheep on the ground and this is a great project that it's we're putting sheep on the ground and creating more opportunity yeah, absolutely any idea why so this landowner sounds like if i've got the story right landowner comes to the game and fish and says hey let's get sheep here any idea of his inspiration or his motivation for doing that uh knowing the history of the area uh you know we do a pretty good uh job of telling the story on our website and we dedicated a website to that, the Sweetwater Rocks Initiative, and is, you know, there are stories from the early 1800s of there was so many sheep on the mountain, you couldn't even count them. And so from the original explorers to, you know, the Oregon Trail's right there. And so it, it was, icon- you know, historically, there's always been sheep there. Mm-hmm. And they're one that they're very, uh, that landowner in particular is, you know, very wildlife friendly. Uh, and understands how important it is and has, has known the history of trying to get sheep in the rocks. And they just said, you know what, it's time. Let's, what can we do to make it happen again? You know, there have been a part of that area there, uh, you know, over the last 50 years has been a lot of landowner changes, which then changes the dynamic. And, you know, uh, and so this landowner just felt, you know, let's, awesome. let's give it another charge. That's very cool. This sounds exciting. This will be something to watch. Just under two years sounds like, but. Something to pay close attention to. Um, let's wrap up on a couple topics. Uh, you mentioned Fair Seminole, and I think, you know, maybe from the folks from Wyoming, that'll ring a bell. But for the folks that don't, what is that? You mentioned success. Yeah. What does that success story look like? So 
Ferris, uh, what was unique about that is on a lot of the happens, a lot of these translocations, ra- transplants is find the right sheep for the landscape. Yeah. And so, you know, so many times it's all oh, just move sheep from say Whiskey Mountain to here. Well, that's a high elevation sheep. You don't take a high elevation sheep and put it down in the desert. And so with a lot of trial and error over the years, uh, they tried something new with Ferris Seminole and actually brought in, uh, identified a sheep herd in Oregon that the landscape was extremely similar and they brought those in. And because it's not just the elevation, the migration, but it's also that lambing season. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if they lamb too early, or too late, they miss the peak nutrition of the forage, so on and so forth, or the weather. And so, yeah, the they brought those in and that population just exploded. And so, uh, you know, and that's another great conservation success story with funding and, you know, the amount of money we've put into it. But then also it's sponsored by the Eastern Chapter. And uh, it's great with their event. They get done and say, how much do you need? Let's write a check, you know, awesome. and which is really neat to see. But, uh, you know, and, and the neat thing in there is um, they're at or near carrying capacity. There's been some natural fire. So the habitat's opened up. We've done the guzzler projects. And it just shows the the uh, the reward you get sure. by the hard work and then also giving the sheep a chance, giving them the right tools to succeed. And they've just taken off and it's been phenomenal. And that to the point where, you know, that as of right now, we call that the cleanest herd in the state Mm -hmm. disease wise and everything. And so that would also be the source herd for Sweetwater Rocks. Geography wise, help our listeners. uh, Where does this, where's this herd at in, in the state of Wyoming? So uh, east, west of Casper. Okay. And so on the road down to say Lander and you go past Al- Alcova and Pathfinder Reservoir and it's all those mountains around there. So the south, and it would be, I will call it the south side of the highway. Sure. And then where the Sweetwater Rocks will then I'll be on the north. North side. And so, and, uh, and if anybody spent any time in there, that terrain doesn't look like it. When you get up close, it is, it's sheep country through and through and it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And so- that's neat. Well, that's neat. That's awesome. You, you have the template for success and, and having to see that, that, that worked, right? Mm-hmm. And now you're kind of starting over again in this Sweetwater Rocks and yeah. of, of making that happen. That'll be exciting to watch for sure. Well, let's, um, obviously, you know, there's, there's ways to, to participate in an organization like yours. There's your fundraising and writing checks and donating money, but let's wrap up with talking about how how a listener can get involved in a, with a group like yours, mm-hmm. you know, and, a, and a, what are some of the ways they can do that? Yeah. You know, for us, for example, I always direct people immediately to our website. Yeah. And we, we really, we spend a lot of money on it. We take a lot of pride in our website and giving the ins and outs of who we are. And, you know, for example, right on there's our conservation vision. Who are we about? Yeah. And so, and then with that is, is like I said, we had, a, we have a dedicated page for the Sweetwater Rocks. And, it's been pretty fun when I tell people about that. As you want to learn who Wyoming Wild Sheep is and what the rocks is about, go here, watch this video. Yeah. And I remember one gentleman, uh, he's on the national board, and he goes, I was so intrigued. I watched it three times in a row. Couldn't take my eyes off. Yeah. And so being able to draw them in there. And then we always say, come to our events, you know, whether it's our banquet. Yeah. And that that's really where I'd say it kicks off. Come to a banquet. We also have a winner. Uh, banquet um, this year. It's going to be outside of uh, Lander uh, and, you know, go look at some of the work that's been done down there. And, uh, but then also just become a member, you know, get, get our publication, get our emails. And and that's the same thing with any of the chapters is just start reading up about it. And then, uh, you know, for us, we're fortunate enough to have these uh, volunteer days and come out and and you're going to see people getting their hands dirty like and, and joining in Minnesota coming out. And yeah, itching. exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and really, and that's the one beauty I got to say about Wyoming is, is for as big of a state as it is, I mean, it is a really tight knit family Yeah, and how many different towns that I go to and I know somebody and, and, and you can have a conversation as person and it's like, it's like your buddy growing up, you know? And so I think that makes Wyoming pretty special. And so with that, it's, 
on projects, uh, coming to a banquet, you're always going to be welcomed with open arms. And I think that's a testament of who we are. And that that is just the kickstart to get people involved and say, you know what, they're good people. Yeah, I want to be involved. Yeah. No, absolutely. You got a great staff. I know Katie and, and Dean and, and some of the hard work that goes into to it's not a huge staff you know you got to use those resources well and keep the folks informed and like i said the publication Mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of neat resources there to help keep us informed Mm -hmm. and all the opportunities and the challenges that that the sheep in wyoming uh face yeah um no pretty neat you know in our business obviously the manufacturing of of firearms we're we're involved with a number of conservation organizations different species and there's such a close-knit relationship there I don't know if a lot of folks know that, you know, there's an excise tax on the firearms and the ammunition we produce, you know, Pittman-Robertson Act, and those those funds end up getting, some of those funds end up getting diverted back to game and fish um, across the country, and then some of those funds specifically to the state. I, I don't know what Wyoming's received the last mm. couple of years. I can remember in 19 or 20, it was around $20 million, just under $20 million. Mm. But that that comes from manufacturers of firearms you know, routed through a, a couple different areas, but, but right back into the state of Wyoming to who, to hopefully help for initiatives, yeah. just like we've been talking about today. Yeah. I mean, and here, here's a, a key statistic when people wonder about these agencies and what the, then what we do to help them out yeah. is, so the study a couple years ago is the, through licensing and permits, that only provides about a quarter of the funding wow. for Game and Fish. Wow. The other three quarters comes from the raffles, the auctions, you know, the governor tags. And they're running the numbers again that it's probably closer to 80. So as all these departments have these deficits, we're the ones making it up. And so, for example, last year, the uh, we have the Wyoming Big Game License Coalition. So there's the governor tags for sheep, moose, bison, and then elk, deer, or antelope. And each one has five. The gross was over $1.8 million. So the seller gets to keep 10%, and then the rest of it goes straight into Wyoming's wildlife. Cool. And so then that's a whole other funding arm of sure. projects. And then what we found is, so, you know, the groups that sell our tags, they're always coming and giving us the money back anyway. Hey, what projects can I write you a check more? Mm-hmm. And so it's in the end... It's all coming back anyway. And so, but it's numbers like that that people don't realize what conservation does. Sure. And, you know, a couple years ago, uh, so it was 22, is we had a great year for the just sheep alone, and we were almost a million dollars. Very cool. And what a, what a number, huh? Yeah. And, and it, I, I can honestly say that money is hitting the ground. Awesome. It's not going for admin fees and someone's salary sure. is, that is going to the ground. It's going to the fair yeah. Seminoles of the world and the yep. Wyoming rocks of the world. That's yeah. neat. So that's neat. Well, that's awesome. Zach, I know you're a busy guy. We appreciate your time today mm-hmm. coming out. Uh, again, for those of you uh, listening, check out the Wyoming Wild Sheep Foundation. Awesome website. Um, awesome group of folks dedicated to a, a really neat cause, a very special animal that, that's benefiting more than, than, than the wild sheep. But uh, we appreciate you listening today and uh, join us again next week. Thank you. If you like what you're hearing here, please take a second and give us a five-star rating and a positive review on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions for topics you'd like discussed or questions you want answered on the podcast. You can reach out on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email to podcast at gunworks.com. Also, be sure and check out our full offering of long-range gear at gunworks.com. Use promo code LRP for free shipping on any order.